this morning I, I was testing our new model and I got a question. I got emailed a question that I didn't quite understand. Uh, and I put it in the model, this GPT-5, and it answered it perfectly. And I really kind of sat back in my chair and I was just like, oh, oh man, here it is moment. And I got over it quickly. I got busy onto the next thing. But it was like, a, I mean, it's what kind of we were talking about. I felt like useless relative to the AI in this thing that I felt like I should have been able to do and I couldn't. And it was really hard, but the AI just did it like that. Yeah. It was, it was a weird feeling. So first things first, GPT-5 is somewhat out. It's testable. Sam Altman is currently testing it. He's actively using it himself. It seems like he's most likely not the only person within OpenAI that's actively using or testing GPT-5. But everything that we do know about GPT-5 until now is essentially the following. First things first, they're removing the model selector. So um, Sam Altman has essentially expressed a level of dissatisfaction with the model selector of open AI. They're looking to essentially abolish that and create a model that is comprised of the best models that open AI has to offer all in one. And that model itself will choose the best model for the given input that you give it. So let's say if you give it a medical question, for example, in that case, it might use O3. If you give it a coding question, it might use O4 or it might use 4O mini, etc. Uh, whatever model they essentially decide to create. So that's number one. Number two, we're also looking at a rumored token limit of 1 million tokens, especially considering the fact that everybody got a taste of what 1 million tokens feels like after the release of Gemini 2.5. And people really do appreciate it. Uh, just about everybody that I know, whenever they have essentially a uh, big code file that they're working with, if they're working with uh, 10,000 lines of code or 20,000 lines of code, they're gonna go ahead and post that into Gemini 2.5 Pro. And it would also be a bit of a disappointment if it didn't actually hit at least the level of Gemini 2.5 Pro, if not even potentially exceeding it, because context is really, really important. Uh, context is just about everything. Additionally, we're also looking at potential video modality. So just like on Gemini 2.5 Pro, you can essentially plug in a YouTube video and that YouTube video can then be uh, essentially treated as an input, just like a word input or a sentence input, etc. The exact same thing is looking to be also rolled out on GPT-5. Now, as per the release, as I mentioned, we're looking at July, August to September, essentially any day right now, any week right now. And if there's a delay, then any month right now. But that's with regards to that. But here's what Sam Altman said with regards to his vision of a future economy, which is honestly a very, very big topic. One thing that AI feels like to me, it's a fast forward button on technology and on uh, possibility because things can be, information can be quantified so quick and a lot of like uh, more menial tasks, even though they're not really menial in people's lives, um, but menial hypothetically uh, can be done quicker yeah. to get a lot of the framework for things done fast. But how will people survive? Like, how do we adjust our structure of finance, of like, if some people own the companies that have the AI and then a lot of people um, are just using the AIs and the agents created by AIs to do things for them. How will society, like societal members, still be able to financially survive? Will there still be money? What is that? Does that make any sense? That it question? totally makes sense. Uh, okay, sorry. I don't know. Neither is anybody else, but I'll tell you my current best guess. Okay. Well, I'll say two guesses. One, I think it is possible that we put, you know, GPT-7 or whatever in everybody's chat GPT. Everybody gets it for free. And everybody has access to just this like crazy thing such that everybody can be more productive, make way more money. It doesn't actually matter that you don't like own the cluster itself, but everybody gets to use it. Mm -hmm. And it turns out even getting to use it is enough that people are like getting richer, faster and more distributed than ever before. That could happen. I think that really is possible. There's another version of this where the most important things that are happening are these systems are discovering you know, new cures for diseases, new kinds of energy, new ways to make spaceships, whatever. And most of that value is accruing to the like cluster owners, us, just so that I'm not dodging the question here. And then I think society will very quickly say, okay, we got to have some new, some new economic model where we share that and distribute that to people. Uh, I used to be really excited about things like UBI. I still am kind of excited, like universal basic income where you just yep. give everybody money. Yeah, you hear that term a lot. Yeah, universal basic inco income. Yeah, I heard you and Rogan talk about that too a while back. I still am kind of excited about that, but I think people really need agency. Like they really need to feel like they have a voice in governing the future and deciding where things go. And I think if you just like say, okay, 
AI is going to do everything and then everybody gets like a, you know, dividend from that. It's not going to feel good and and I don't think it actually would be good for people. So I think we need to find a way where we're not just like, if we're in this world, where we're not just distributing money or wealth. Like actually, I, I don't just want like a check every month. What I would want is like an sh ownership share mm -hmm. in whatever the AI creates so that I feel like I'm participating in this thing that's going to compound and get more valuable over time. So I sort of like universal basic wealth better than universal basic income. And I think I don't like basic either. I want like universal extreme wealth for everybody. Um, but but even then, like I think what people really want is the agency to kind of co-create the future together. Mm. And, and in a world where it's like the AI is mostly coming up with the new scientific inventions, at least we've got to still have humans like invent the new culture and have that be a very distributed thing. Now, few of one's mind like after this is like literally blown. So bring it, yeah! Fuck yeah, dude. I'm gonna upload myself into this plant in a second. But he actually asks a pretty smart question. He asks as to whether this is gonna be like an America thing or a worldwide thing. Now, before I get into the UBI or universal basic compute element itself, I wanna cover one thing. Uh, Alaska is one of the only countries that essentially shares the revenue that it generates from its oil reserves, oil resources, etc., down with its citizens. So if you live in Alaska, if uh, you have a citizenship in Alaska, if you have existed in Alaska for a certain period of time, I don't remember the exact specifications exactly, but if you fit the criteria, you will receive a check or a some form of dividend payment directly in your bank account at the end of the year that is dependent upon how much money was put into the uh, sovereign national fund directly from the revenue generated from oil sales or oil extraction, etc. That is a perfect example of dividend payments that are directly related to a to, to a resource or to a certain process of a certain nation. The exact same thing could be applied to AI as well. I'm not exactly sure if AI 2027 covered this, but I do remember seeing this idea somewhere. So it's not a it's not a fully unique idea that I just generated or developed right now. Uh, the idea of having AI participate in certain economic activities, whether it's freelancing, whether it's uh, mining Bitcoin or finding a better way to mine Bitcoin or anything, and then giving those dividends out to the public whilst also maintaining a monetary system so you don't necessarily eradicate currency fully that seems like the most logical thing to do now whether it's going to be done or not i don't know sam altman also essentially mentioned that if the people see that there's this uh divide between who gets the resources people will essentially just sit down and say you know what we'd like some too communism is the way forward for the Russian people. Here's more with regards to AGI benchmarks and what Sam Altman actually considers as a finish line, which I found pretty important. What is the race for? Because you hear about AI and then you hear about AGI. Uh, and then you hear about super intelligence. What is, what is this race that's going on? How real is it? And what is the race for? When I was a kid, the race was like the megahertz race and then it became the gigahertz race. Everybody wanted a computer with a faster processor. And, oh, yeah. You know, Intel would come out with this one and then AMD would come out with this one. And every like it turned out that those gigahertz measurements eventually were not even that helpful. Like you could have one that had a lower number and it was it, in practice it was faster. And eventually I think it was Apple that realized they should just stop talking about the clock speed of their computers. And you probably don't even know what the processor speed of your iPhone is today. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that was a big thing and it kind of disappeared. And I think the same thing has been happening in AI where everybody was racing on these benchmarks. You know, I score this on this benchmark and this on that one. And now people are realizing that like, okay, the benchmarks are kind of saturated. We went through the equivalent of our megahertz race with our benchmark race. And now people kind of don't care about that as much. And now it's like, who's using the model, who's getting the value out of it, things like that. Um, but... But I do think people still feel like we're heading towards some milestone. What the milestone is, they disagree on. But maybe it's maybe it's a system that's capable of doing its own AI research and its own sort of self-improvement. Um, maybe it's a system that is like smarter than all of humans put together. But they feel like there is some finish line to cross. I actually don't quite feel like this. But I think a lot of people in the industry that there's some 
finish line that we're going to cross. Maybe it's this like self-improvement moment. Maybe you call that super intelligence. Um, and I think there is a sort of, there's like a race to get somewhere, but people don't agree on where it's to or something. Mm. What are you racing towards? You feel like it's a great question. Um, I don't have like a finish line in mind. There's nothing I could say to that. I don't think I can articulate anything where I would say like, this is mission complete. But if I, if I had to give like a self referential answer there, you know, the moment where we would rather give our research cluster, like our, you know, GPUs that we run all of our AI experiments on the moment where we would rather give that to an AI researcher rather than our brilliant team of human researchers, that does at least seem like some kind of very different new era. So a couple of things with regards to this. The first thing is that he compares the gigahertz to the actual benchmarks that we use right now. Now, now personally, I don't know how much I would agree with the actual statement of like benchmarks currently don't serve a good enough purpose or they might stop serving a purpose. The only thing that I do know is that we are running out of benchmarks and HLE, which is humanity's last exam, which is the benchmark that Grok4 Heavy not aced, but it did really well on uh, scoring close to 40 to 50%. And that's Grok4 Heavy with that agentic unlimited inference where it has an extended period of time that it can essentially think about a problem. It releases like four or five agents that will infer or think about a certain problem. One comes up with a solution, then they all proofread and then they proceed. Whereas Grok4 Heavy is just one instance. Uh, sorry, Grok4 Classic, the actual classic Grok4 is just one instance. So. Grok4 Heavy scored close to 40 to 50% on that. So how many models do we have left until humanity's last exam is essentially aced and then we're left with no benchmarks? That's a pretty big question. Alternatively, there's also been a suggestion of actually using video games as benchmarks. And we've covered the research paper on this channel where because we're running out of these theoretical benchmarks where AI could essentially solve a problem or tick a box, the alternative solution is putting AI directly into like, let's say Red Dead Redemption 2, and then testing its ability to basically solve the game from start to finish. And in that case, you're essentially testing everything that is necessary for the future of AI once it actually has a physical body, which I think all AI researchers, all tech founders envision further down the line. As a matter of fact, uh, Elon Musk even spoke about this at the uh, Grok4 release, how they have Tesla bot up and ready for direct integration with Grok. Next up, I also wanted to show you this segment where they speak about power and privacy, which I found very, very important. There's a lot of talk about like Palantir and Peter Thiel and their company about being like, a, um, you know, they got to deal with from Trump about to have this surveillance or not a surveillance state, but to create a database on most of uh, America. But it starts to feel like a surveillance state, you know, um, do you feel like we will need something like that in order for uh, the future? You know, do you feel like something like that is included in the future? So I don't know about that specifically. I, I mean, I think Palantir and Peter do a lot of great stuff. Uh, but I, I, again, I can't comment on this specifically. What I'll say generally I am worried that the more AI in the world we have, the more surveillance the world is going to want because the tool is so powerful. The government will say like, how do we know people aren't using it to make bombs or bio weapons or whatever? Mm -hmm. And the answer will be more surveillance. And I'm very afraid of that. So I don't, I think we really have to defend rights to privacy. I don't think those are absolute. I'm like totally willing to compromise some privacy for collective safety, but history is that the government takes that way too far. And I'm really nervous about that. Do you guys feel like the new government kind of, or do you feel like the government is still like a real thing? I don't feel like the government anyway. You don't? When the US government bombed Iran recently, I remember waking up that morning and seeing that news or whatever time it was. Uh, and I was like, oh, that's what actual power looks like. You know, that we're in like a Maybe someday we get there, but it was like a really stark reminder of however important we think this is. It's like, 
there are people that have just like this unimaginable power and might and can kind of do whatever they want. And that's definitely not us. Now, look, on this segment, there isn't really a lot that I can add with regards to actually enriching your knowledge or giving you additional facts that you might not necessarily know. But I decided to play this segment because I have the belief and I, I have the conviction that Sam Altman might possibly be the most powerful human being in the upcoming 10 to 20 years and most powerful by a great margin of how powerful other human beings could have ever been. So if OpenAI maintains this number one position over the upcoming 10 to 20 years, and there's a possibility that it might not, because even from the uh, actual dot-com bubble, you had a bunch of companies pop up, then they disappeared. Google wasn't necessarily like the number one player during the actual dot-com bubble, and now we are going through an AI bubble, it is confirmed. Google wasn't the number one player. They slowly rose up, acquired YouTube, acquired all these companies, made all these innovations, and now they're number one and they've maintained this position over the uh, over over the years. So my point is OpenAI might not be the next number one company over the upcoming 10, 20 or 100 years, depending upon how everything's going to change. But if it does, Sam Altman will be the most powerful person on earth uh, in terms of wealth, in terms of uh, government influence, especially if the government, if you've read AI 2027, if you haven't, I highly recommend that you do, especially if OpenAI starts developing AI solutions directly for the government, the level of control, the level of influence that they'll have is just inconceivable, like uh, hard to even imagine. So considering that, it's always very comforting to hear Sam Altman's opinion on both privacy and power, number one. To hear repetitions on the fact that he might not necessarily be as power hungry as the media likes to make him out to be. Like uh, with all these videos about he, him being a master manipulator and power hungry, etc. Now, I also wanted to share this part on GPT personalization and what he calls imprinting because this serves as a vision for how he envisions GPT-5, GPT-6, and GPT-7. Um, I was talking to this friend of mine though about how he uses ChatGPT and he's been using it a lot for a couple of years now. And he noticed recently that he, start, he started giving it personality tests. He'd upload any personality test he could find to ChatGPT mm -hmm. and say, based on what you know about me, answer this. And he had never, he had never like told it, here's my personality. It had just learned it from the questions he asked mm -hmm. over the years. And on everyone he tried, it got exactly the answer and the, exactly the outcome he would get. And so that's not like, he didn't, get uploaded, he didn't get merged, he didn't plug something into his brain, but somehow like the pattern of him had gotten imprinted into this AI. Wow. Maybe we're not as complex as we think we are. Or maybe we are and AI can just learn it really well. AI can like represent these very complex things. One of those two. But that was a real moment for me of like, wow, you know, the merge maybe can happen in a very different way than we thought. Yeah. Now, look, everybody knows that like GPT-40 is personalized and it keeps memories on you and you could see the memories, what it does know, how it analyzes uh, your inputs, etc. That's that's a well-known fact. But what's lesser known is that OpenAI is now actively looking to develop actual hardware, like a mobile phone. They're still unsure about the, the, the definite structure of it, but they did mention that it most likely won't be a mobile phone. It'll be something that's supplemental, something that you can carry around, like a, a keychain or a little block with a, with a, with a microphone and a, uh, I don't know, a uh, projected screen, something along those lines that will essentially work to personalize your chat GPT experience further by being constantly with you. I don't know how okay you're going to you're, you're going to actually be with this, but uh, constantly recording, constantly analyzing your day to day life and further enhancing the personalization aspect between you, the user and open AI, uh, open AI based products, because Sam Altman, from what I've gathered, essentially believes that personalization is the key to, is the key to a better customer experience between the customer and chat GPT based products.